so first off, just wanted to say uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Donal. Uh, I'm working in Airbnb at the moment. Uh, this is Christian. Um, basically, we're going to be essentially your hosts, as it were, tonight. Also with Jamie. Jamie's from Airbnb as well. I'll come over this way a bit. Okay, cool. Uh, if you need to get connected, just jump on the guest Wi-Fi. The password is welcome to Cuba or welcome to Cuba with a capital C, all one word. Uh, as I said, we just wanted to welcome you and thank you for coming. This is the third meetup of, I guess, what's a kind of a reborn Irish network operators group. So anyone who was at the previous uh, meetup, we got a bit of history, um, not just on the INEX in Ireland, but also on some of the early uh, attempts at a network operator group in Ireland. So it's great to see you here. Thank you so much for coming. Um, Briefly, from occupational health and safety, uh, fire exits over here. There's also fire exits at the end of the building. Uh, the toilets, if anyone needs to go to the toilet. Unfortunately, it's kind of behind closed doors, so I'm going to leave out two uh, passes over here. So just come tag me or grab a pass if you want to go to the toilets. Down the end, out through the doors, and back in again. So you need a pass to get back in, right? But we'll go and check if there's anyone locked out every so often. Um, we've mentioned photography and privacy. Uh, the reason for that as well is that it's really good if you're trying to build a community or trying to help build a community just to show people uh, people <laughs> so that there is actual real faces. Um, and we'd, we might take some photos tonight if that's okay. I say we, I mean myself, Christian, and Jamie. I don't mean Airbnb. So just for INOG, that's all. So again, if you have any issues with that, please let us know. Um, we're going to do. We're going to attempt to record the sessions and then uh, upload them potentially to something like YouTube or Vimeo. We haven't spoken about it. This is our first attempt to record the sessions. Um, I might hand over to, to Christian to say a couple of words. I've kind of just checked off the the basic intro stuff. I would say at any point in time, come grab myself, Christian, or Jamie, and we'll sort you out if you have any queries, if you have any questions. Catherine is looking after us front of house. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, so if you want another drink or something, or you need more snacks, or you want tea and coffee, you can, you can just go in there. Um, the other thing is, I don't know, we haven't said this about the presentations, but my guess is that, you know, stick your hand up if you want to ask a question, but I'll let the presenters uh, dictate that. Uh, Christian, over to you. Thank you. So, first off, big thumbs up and many thanks to Donald and Airbnb for hosting us. I mean, I would say, a lot of thanks to Donald for getting us spaces for all three meetups until now. So come on, let's give him a round of applause, please. <laughs> um, so what I wanted to say is that up until now, all the meetings have been rather informal. We don't have any official sponsors. We don't have any official entity. Although going forward, at some point, we might have to think about it. Right now, though, um, I think we're just a bunch of engineers and well, we're happy to act like that. That still means that we need places to meet up and to do our presentations. Up until now, Donald's done a fantastic job finding places with everything, you know, not only the place, but also recording facilities, presentation facilities, beer, snacks, everything, right? We still need that going forward. Um, right now, we've tried to do kind of one meeting a month. Um, I think we'll stick to that for the time being and we'll see how it goes really. It's, we don't want to seem too well organized, right? So, <laughs> um, so this is basically a call if you know of a space that would be happy to uh, host us for a couple of hours on a nice wintry uh, Tuesday next month, then please let us know, get in touch with myself or Donald and then we can take it from there. Um, that's the space. Now, the content as well. Uh, we're trying to uh, get interesting talks. Uh, hopefully today we'll have three interesting talks. Uh, next time, I mean, in about an hour and a half, two hours, the most you can, you can fit in is three large talks or a, a few more smaller ones. Don't take anything as a blueprint. We're happy to, if you have a five minute talk, just tell us and you'll get a five minute slot. If you have a half an hour one, which actually deserves half an hour, then we'll be happy to give you half an hour. 
So get in touch with us. You can contact us anywhere on Twitter, on, on, the, on the Google group. If you have something you want to talk about, it doesn't need to have a, you know, a fancy PowerPoint presentation. If it's a small project that's close to your heart and it's relevant to people and you think it's worth getting out there, please come to us. Tell us. So everything, any size, just um, put it out there. Um, and also, right now, it's been mostly myself and Donald trying to, to organize this. We're kind of aware of the fact that as more people join and as meetings get bigger, there's a bit more work to, do, to be done when you know, organizing stuff. So if you think that you have a bit of time to, uh, <clears throat> to give to the group and help with the admin side of it, so that means you know, organizing stuff, be it online, be it tools, be it the website, uh, which is on, on GitHub and needs a bit of work. Um, Anything we're using, for example, Google Groups, maybe that's not the final place where we're staying. We might want to host our a discussion forum somewhere. So we're also looking for ideas. It's not only, you know, uh, doing some work. Also, if you have some suggestions, some past experience, uh, please get in touch again. Um, I'll let Donald talk about the prize because that was his, his last minute idea and it was fantastic. So, so just, oh, just really quickly, um, it's kind of relevant to what I'm working on at the moment. So we're kind of trying to define our, our campus standards. And I, I don't know, I've worked in a lot of large enterprises and telcos and so on and so forth. But the funny thing was that it was really hard to define what a campus was. I mean, it sounds easy, but we're going to have a little prize at the end of the night for the person who has the best definition for what a campus is. So that's just a little bit of an aside. Um, we haven't yet defined what the prize is, but we'll figure that out. Uh, and the agenda, I guess, um, intro for myself and Christian. Uh, Jose? Jose? Not Jose. Um, Jose is going to uh, talk to us a little bit about uh, network automation. I think a, a talk he said delivered at SRECon, which is awesome. Um, the expectation is around 7, 40, 7, 45. We're going to have some pizza. There should be five meat pizzas. There should be five vegetarian pizzas. Go nuts. A uh, little bit of a break. Please talk to someone who you don't know, if, if you're in that way inclined. If you're a bit more of an extrovert, just say hello. Uh, no one's going to bite. And this is what it's about. It's community. Just you know, get involved. Um, we've got Darren. So uh, Darren, I don't need to stick your, your oops, password. Uh, stick your hand up there. Darren's going to talk to us. Um, about some of his adventures in, uh, in I guess, uh, coding for NetEng and uh, writing demons and so on and so forth. And then uh, Christian is going to talk to us uh, a little bit about uh, a slightly different topic. Rather than doing presentations, and this is what Christian was talking about, um, he, he wants to put forth like a topic or an idea and maybe have a little bit of a Q&A or discussion after it. So like, we're totally open to the format. It's not about broadcast, so we just want to get people involved. And that, hopefully, we're going to wrap up around, uh, around. We're going to have a hard stop at 9. And if anyone then wants to uh, you know, continue down to a local pub or go somewhere else or have a chat, that's cool. But uh, from, from our perspective, from the, the host, from the space here, we're going to have to reset the space. So I'm going to be like going around nudging people at like 9 o'clock. But feel free to grab some drinks, snacks, whatever. Like I said, there's going to be pizza in a little while. And uh, what we might do is... Jose, can we, we bring you down and get, get you to do a quick intro? And Jose is going to give us a bit of a, uh, a talk. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Any questions thus far? No? Sweet. OK, cool. OK, just give us one, one or two seconds. We're just going to do a quick AV swap. Jose, you're OK with using the microphone? Are you happy enough? OK, cool. That's all right. Don't, don't be too loud. Um, yeah, so again, just using the microphone. So that's one thing I suppose that always happens at these sorts of things when you try and record them. <laughs> uh, maybe if you have a question or if we do do questions, just wait till the mic gets to you uh, so that we can actually record your question for posterity and you don't have to play it back from the presenter. But anyway, I, I'll hand you over to uh, Jose. Thank you very much. One, two, three. Can you guys hear me? Yes? No? Shout, scream, start leaving. Okay, so I'm Jose. I am a production engineer at Facebook. 
Um, and this is a talk I did at SRECon, and it's a talk I've done in other languages, so if I start speaking Spanish, feel free to stop me. So this is me, and in case you're wondering, these are the other guys, right? Mikael, some of you guys know, Ayuresh is a, is a range from the US, and David's also local uh, in Dublin. And he also does this presentation with me, but now he's in London, so he couldn't make it. So the team where I'm at, uh, it's basically called Network Infrastructure Engineering, and our focus is reliability in the network, right? Our goal is to have, is to ensure that the network has no negative impact in uh, Facebook's production, right? Which it's harder than it sounds. So what are we gonna be talking about? And I'm going to actually bend the laptop a little bit so I can look at this instead of looking at the projector. Oops. So we're gonna be talking a little bit about Facebook scale because it seems to be something that uh, people don't realize, so just some quick general numbers. Uh, a play on words uh, about FDN, some tales from the real world, um, what are we doing in the future, and Q&A. Since this group is relatively small, feel free to, you don't have to wait till the end. If anyone has a question, just raise your hand, throw something at me, start shouting, and I'll try to answer right there. So there's no need to wait until the end. So, uh, let's talk about Facebook scale. So this is a, basically a slide with a lot of numbers about the active users that we have. The interesting one is that we have monthly almost 1.5 billion users, right? And the most interesting part about this from the network perspective is that 83% of those are outside of the US, which essentially means that there's lots of traffic and a global footprint. So essentially this is a global network, right? Uh, which brings uh, a lot of interesting challenges, right? And the patterns of traffic that we tend to have, you know, tend to be, there, ten, there tends to be two different problems, right? One problem tends to be machine to user, which, you know, it's constantly growing, but it's a lot more manageable than, you know, machine to machine. There's a lot of services that are very bandwidth hungry, and uh, a joke that we tend to have is that developers always see the network as an infinite socket, right? So this tends to be the problem that's more uh, hard to manage, right? One thing we used to say, or we tend to say in Facebook, is that basically engineers build robots and robots manage the network. And this is the center of what I'm going to talk about, right? So let's talk about a little bit about Facebook defined networking, which is a little trolling from our side, right? So if you look at this picture, this is a simplified version of how our monitoring pipeline works. And I'm going to touch about some of those systems and how those systems are actually allow us to scale and allow us to maintain the network that we maintain, right? But well, I'm gonna go back to this, but this is like, you know, big picture type of slide, right? And some things have obvious names and some things don't, but don't worry. So for example, Epinet. Epinet is essentially a source of truth. The idea behind Epinet is that it's a database where we have modeled every single component of the network. This means that in theory, and we do it most of the time as well in practice, I can go wipe parts of the network and just, you know, for example, we're changing a vendor, we're changing a platform. We are moving from uh, a particular vendor to our own solution, to our own wedge devices, right? All the information that those devices need regarding configuration, sessions, BGP, IPs, policies, et cetera, et cetera, is actually modeled, right? And we call that FENet. Uh, another interesting part is drain services, which I know for some people this exists in your organizations, some other people uh, don't, but essentially these are services that allow to take traffic from devices automatically and programmatically, which is like, oh, this router, this router has a problem, an issue. I, I didn't like how it looked at me, so your traffic is going away from you fast, right? So we have automation for that. Then NODA, which is our packet loss detection system. Megasor, which is a correlation engine to essentially convert, you know, a number of alarms into a master alarm, a master event, that sort of thing. And now let's talk a little bit about how all of this ties together, right? And essentially, if you look to the left, you have sources of truth, right? These are essentially systems that hold what should be the state, what should be the ideal state, right? Or what are, you know, indicators of issues, right? For example, every net, what I mentioned, it has all the database, it's a database with all of the network model, right? So essentially, I can go do reality checks, and that's what we use for things such as the audit framework, right? Which is like, well, this device should have X amount of line cards. Do you actually have those line cards, right? or whatever, sessions or whatever it is, right? And essentially on the right side, we have consumer of those alarms, right? Or consumer of those events, right? And we're gonna talk a little bit about some of those in our, in the next section. So, tales from the real world. For example, a typical problem is how do you manage circuits? Or how do you manage circuits at the scale that 
Facebook has, right? I talk about the fact that we are a global network, which means we have circuits in every part of the world, which means in every single moment there is some vendor or there's some part of the network where, oh, we are moving this fiber trunk from behind a bridge to up to the bridge from outside of the tree, so we need to move traffic around, right? So in the beginning, this was essentially very manual. If you don't move traffic and this event happens, then maybe you have, you know, terrace of capacity or whatever it is going down or going up or flapping, etc. This causes impact for everyone, right? And we want to have no negative impact. So basically, in the, we took a hybrid approach, which was we had a script that essentially that script started generating, oh, this is all the config that you need to push to move traffic away from the devices. It would create a nice task for a non call person to actually digest and tell them, well, these are the things that you need to do by hand, but it was, you know, it was very tidy. You, it would simply be something that you'd have to do on your own call, right? So how is this now? Well, basically, now this is fully automated. So how do we fully automate this? Well, essentially, we get a notification from that vendor, whoever they are, that gets sent to an engine that parses the, the data that we care about because there is some data in that email or that however we get that notification that we don't care about. We create a task to our internal task system. Then we have a system called Poltergeist, which again, we like to have names that don't really mean anything. But, you know, somebody wrote it and said, oh, I'm going to call this Poltergeist because this was the movie I was watching yesterday, right? Uh, and essentially, this system will process that task uh, and, you know, call the drain services. Hey, all of these links or all of this, this part of the network has to, we have to remove traffic from this uh, starting at this time, right? So that get, gets called. Traffic goes away from those links. The maintenance ends. Poltergeist realizes this and hey, says, okay, I need to put those links back in production. And the links get put back in production after they go through some audits. Yes? Questions so far? Yes? Yeah, you need a mic? And that gives him an opportunity to drink water. Go again. Sorry, my bad. Okay. Thank you. So I actually have three questions. Um, Good. <laughs> um, you won the prize. Do you <laughs> do you uh, do you guys run into issues uh, parsing notifications from vendors? Because I've seen sometimes it's like, oh, we've scheduled it today, but we're actually sending you a rescheduled notification when it's going to happen, you know, in a few days. Do so you they just, come, just parse their emails, or is there some it I mean, it depends, right? It's what I'm, I'm mentioning. We have hundreds of, and with some, like, serious ones, right? Like, we have, they have APIs, so, so there's mm -hmm. machines talking to machines, and everything is magic, and everything comes with a nice format, you know? Some is over email. But typically, when they send those reschedules, the system is able to process them, right? So as long as they do it, you know, not a minute before or three seconds before this is supposed to happen, it's fine. Um, so, uh, second question, uh, maintenance ends, do you rely on their uh, notification that it ended or... Yeah, the notification usually says, well, we're going to, the fiber is going to be moved, you know, and it's going to take 17 hours, so this starts at here and ends here, right? Yeah, well, not always. <laughs> well, when they don't, we poke them, right? Okay, all right. So, um, no, I mean, like, there is, a, there is also, I mean, there's a lot of, like, specifics, right? And there's a lot, lot of, like, lessons to learn out of this, but, for example, when when we get those, which uh, like, well, this event starts now and it ends never. That gets flagged and eventually a human. I mean, that gets flagged and the on call has to act in within certain time range. Well, mm. Depends. We typically we typically leave it. I mean, we typically don't wake anybody up for this because you know, like those links could fail at any time and we should be able to survive without them. You know, redundancy, magic, blah blah. blah. Um, so it's typically look at someone during business hours, which is like, and then the vendor gets nicely poked, like. Dude, we need, you need to tell me when this ends. And third question, thank you for answering all of those. And um, uh, of, like when you uh, like fail a link, you know, take it out of service, do you do any checks for that there is a capacity available to yes. take it over? Or is it more, is it part of the um, monitoring system or is it part of the just provisioning system where you, the provisioning system just takes care that makes sure that there is always capacity available? So as, as many big places, there's usually three or four systems that are doing basically the same thing, right? That were probably coded by three different guys. So yes, there is, I mean, there are systems to do this, right? There's checks that happen before the drains are actually, I mean, Poltergeist calls the drainer, and since this, these are all modules, these are all boxes, as I showed before, each model has their own set of sanity checks, right? And part of the sanity check is, 
are what you're doing is saying, like, do I have enough capacity? And, you know, like, will I, be, will I be able to survive this, right? And if no, then, I mean, whenever something breaks, typically in this flow, a human gets involved because computers are dumb and humans are smart, right? So, yeah. Thanks. I don't know. Do we have a second question? Just over here, real quick. Sorry, probably should have just passed it through. Oh, okay, so we're good? Good? Cool, okay. Thanks. So, but what about fiber eating sharks? It happens, right? So, how do we how do we handle this situation, right? Which I mean, I don't know. Maybe our fibers are tasty, but they eat a lot of them. Um, we get a we get a notification through our monitoring system. A, a series of links have gone down. The, those tend to be a lot because, again, like most of the time, at least in my experience, it's not reality. The reality is that you have a series of paths more than a series of links because you have you have whatever, 30 links, 40 links, 100 links, and the reality is that they go all through the same logical path, right? So you think in terms of paths. But you get 100 alarms saying, oh, these 100 links have failed, right? Or this amount of capacity is gone. So Megasol grabs all of those and creates essentially a master alarm, right? A single alarm out of those 100 or probably 300. And this gets logged into a database that we call OperDB by a system called Vendors, very creative, the developer. I think the developer of this was David, so David is very creative. And essentially, this is an operational database that we have to keep track of every single component in the network. Uh, the idea of this is the same. Like, for example, the idea is if somebody wants to know this line card or this device or this fan or, you know, whatever, this uh, link, tell me all the operational events that this has had over the past, you know, year, day, 30 days, whatever. So you can have, like, reports and you can have your top offenders, you know, all this magical stuff. So this gets logged. Essentially, all oh, those 100 links went down, right? Then vendors checks FVNet to, figure, to essentially figure out who owns those links, right? Are those links our own uh, fiber? Are those links somebody else's? Or are those links managed by us? Or are they managed by someone else? He figures that out from FVNet, and I think I'm saturating the microphone a little bit. Um, and a task is created. The carrier is contacted about the event with whatever method they prefer. Some people, again, we have API, so they get essentially, hey, hey Mr. Vendor, we just lost all of this, go check, or they get an email, whatever they prefer. Um, the system basically is waiting for the links to come back. When the links come back, this gets put into a hold down timer for all the VGP funds. That was David again, CCIE, right in Python. Uh, so he called this a hold down timer. It's essentially a monitoring period while you know the links came back, but I don't trust that they're actually stable, right? When that ends, the event is closed, vendor gets updated, and uh, typically the carrier gets a notification, hey, we close this event, all the capacity is back in service. Yes, questions? Good, I can drink water. Okay, who's that? Same again? Okay. So a uh, system writes to the vendor, like a carrier, and they usually have humans on the other end. Yeah. Um, they will respond in some nonsensical, like, blah, 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 you know, something happened, we don't know. How do you deal with that then? That typically gets put into the task. And um, let's say that, I mean, like, most of the time you don't care. And most of the time, uh, most of the time these are is issues that are easy for them to troubleshoot, right? For example, like, recently I was going somewhere. I was going to Spain. And, like, uh, we had a, a new uncle and the new... I, I, Half an hour before I actually left to the airport, we had like a major, major, like ridiculous amount of capacity, right? And it's essentially a single cable, right? Like somebody was streaming a tree and they went in, and now there's no cable, right? So those type of events, regardless of what they answer, right? Like it's, it, they can figure out quickly after they get noticed, right? Like, you know, like, hey, this happened. And they, they start doing like the optical testing and, oh, we have a cut between this city and this city, right? So uh, that gets, usually gets put into the task and uh, I think at this point, most of them are used to the fact that these are automated, and we put it on the notification, right? Like, this is an automated notification. You know, you will, if you want, if you need more information, you might get a reply, but it's not going to be immediate. But most of the time, it's not needed. I mean, there's very rare few cases where we tell them, we just lost 100 links, and they'll go like, oh, I don't see anything broken. So. What, what about, like, grave failures where you're, like, 
didn't really do down, but you're seeing some CRC errors on a link, and they're like saying, oh, it's all good on our end, and you have to kind of those massage usually, them those a usually lot. Go, those usually go to humans. I mean, after, okay. I mean, my, my team, or like the, the first goal, and like some Amazon folks will, will remember this, like our goal is to reduce the impact, right, or minimize the impact as much as possible. So for example, one of these links, instead of like going hard down, it's just like flapping like crazy or it has, you know, millions of CRC errors, it will get drained, right? It will be like, I don't know what's wrong with you, but traffic is no, is no longer going to be there, right? And then, in theory, most of the time, this can take whatever amount it takes to get resolved because you have redundancy built in to survive this, right? And what you care about is that you don't have a, a link that has millions of errors per second taking live traffic, right? As long as the traffic is gone, they can take their time and they can interact with one of our one of our technical people either in the data center or in, you know, optical engineers, right? That can say, okay, send me the results for this and uh, let's troubleshoot, right? Depending on if they own it, or we own it, or however it's arranged. Yes? Cool. Okay, so now I'm going to show you my favorite graph ever. This is a graph of pain, right? And this is my favorite graph ever because um, this is a graph of the memory. Uh, I'm, I'm going to use vague terms, right? So you guys can figure out who the vendor for this magical set of devices is because that's basically what they asked me. And I told them, give me the patch in time and I won't shame you publicly. And they did, so only four months, only four months. Um, so I'm going to be vague, right? Um, but essentially, this is, the, this is the free memory on the CPU of a series of very large routing devices, right? And as you can see here, the memory decreases, then something happens, the memory recovers, then decreases, recovers, decreases, recovers. So essentially, and you can see how we learn, right? Like if you start looking at this, you see like the thresholds were higher and then they got, you know, smaller and, you know, like it, suddenly it got into sync. So, what would happen if we didn't do anything? Well, if we didn't do anything, the device was, will, would not fail gracefully, right? It would start failing in mysterious and magical ways, such as, for example, not speaking the protocols it needs to speak, but not in a complete way, right? It would sometimes reply to routing, sometimes it wouldn't, sometimes it would reply to monitoring, sometimes it wouldn't. And if you left it in this state, it would eventually black hole most of the traffic, right? And you couldn't, and you would be, you wouldn't be able to manage it, right? So, at one, if you left it for long enough, you would essentially would have to go and off on type of thing, right? Which is, I had to, do, I had to do that once, and the person I was, I mean, obviously I, I was in a data center, and the person I had to tell this to, asked me to 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 say it five times, right? Because he was like, "Do you want me to do what?" And I, yes, that, right? Um, okay. So essentially, how, how, what was the workaround for this, right? Because this was essentially a memory leak, and the memory leak could only be fixed by the vendor by fixing, you know, the code that was actually causing the leak, right? So what was the workaround to survive? Because as you can see, and this started earlier, but as you can see, this was from October of last year, essentially to, I can't read because I don't have my glasses, but let's assume that's the end of January, according to my trauma memory. Um, so what was the workaround for this? The workaround for this was quite intrusive. You essentially, I mean, these were devices that have two CPUs, where one is active and the other is in standby, and essentially you would have to force the active CPU to reload so the other one would take over, and then when the other one recovered, you would have to do it the same thing. And this was, you know, complicated maneuver. And of course, you have to take traffic, because if you didn't take traffic, this would generate loss, so not good. So how would you do this with humans? Well, lots of them and coffee, right? How do we actually do this? We have a system called ODS, which essentially is a um, key value store where we have a lot of metrics about a lot of things, right? For example, in this case, is where the source of that graph, right? Like the, the free memory for that platform, right? So we have something called detectors, which are essentially ways that machines can actually read those graphs, right? So we can say, okay, so if this threshold has this change, whatever the change is, and then, then you get to be created or insert math, right? Whether it's, you know, more than this, more than that in this time period, or you do rate of change, or you do predictions, or you do all sorts of magical things, right? Basically, if you change the behavior, fire an alarm, right? 
So we configured that. Okay? It, we already had it configured, but we put it in a much more aggressive way, right? Because we had it at, well, if you are at 10%, if you only have 10% of your free memory, freak out. And this, this happened at 70% of free memory, right? It would just get into a state where it will go insane. So we configured that. That generated an alarm. When the threshold went, be, when the memory went below that threshold, we put it into a safe mode. We put it into, we put the alarm to be at a place where we knew we had at least four or five hours uh, where the device would go insane. Right? The alarm gets generated. FBAR takes the alarm. FBAR is essentially our automated human. It means Facebook automatic remediation, and essentially it's an automated human. FBAR will have a piece of, of code that will essentially tell them what to do in this situation, right? And this is uh, the same thing you would have in some organizations as what you would call a ROM book, right? If this situation happens, this is what you should do, you know, step by step, right? And this is the conditions you should check, which essentially, if you have that, you should make it into a script because that's essentially, you know, programming logic, right? So it would have a, it would have a, it would have logic that would say, okay, so this is what I want you to check, right? You need to, before you start doing any of this, you should check, you need to check that you actual, your standby CPU is there and it looks fine and it's synchronized and you can use it and everything is wonderful. And if everything that you expect is actually there, you need to drain this entire device. So let's assume that was the case. The device gets drained. The drainers have their own sanity checks. If they all pass, the, the production traffic gets out of that device. Then we reload the active CPU. We wait until the standby CPU takes over. We wait until the redundancy recovers. And then we essentially do it all over again, right? When everything is back into what we call a clean state, the traffic is put back into this device, right? And this is essentially how we survive this situation for probably four months due to an entire set of big routing devices that we had, a part of uh, our fleet, right? Questions so far? Yes? Water time. So just a brief question. So when you say part of your routing fleet, is that your enterprise network or is that your product? Product. That's okay. product. <clears throat> and that's just, I mean, that's just my personal, my, my favorite graph. We have other stories. Like we are fantastic at doing duct tape. Um, okay. So, so hopefully now this is a little, a little bit more clear and I'm going to give you to, again, to give you some idea of scale and to give you some idea of, of you know, what these systems allow us to do, I'm going to talk about some numbers, you know, so an average 30 days when I did this presentation, which doesn't change too much, you know, it, it increases, but it doesn't change significantly. So in 30 days, emitter, which is essentially an engine that processes syslogs and SNMP, SNMP traps, would process over 3.3 billion messages, and out of those, only 1% will result in alarms because devices are noisy and they like to chat. So, but in between those 3.3 million, 33, 3.3 uh, billion, 33 million are of some importance, right? <coughs> so that would get created as an alarm. That alarm will go to our alert manager engine and then FBAR will grab most of those. And it will typically in 30 days run over 750,000 times on the working alarms and it would automatically resolve 99.6% of them. And this is due to multiple reasons such as transient events. For example, if a link or a series of links went down and then the whole vendor thing take, took over and if this was an external event to our network, in reality we don't care. As soon as those links are back online and they are taking traffic and they all say everything is okay, we don't care. There's no, there's no uh, need to involve a human, right? So 99.6 of those will never see a human. Carrier maintenance, which is the system that essentially takes traffic on and off of the devices when there's a carrier maintenance, will act on around 300 maintenances. Uh, vendors will notify transport uh, of around 1,100 transport events, which is essentially the shark having fun. And Megasaur will correlate uh, the number was too gigantic, so I, I, don't, I didn't put it here, but thousands and thousands of alarms into around 1,200 unique master alarms. And those alarms, most of the time, are consumed by automation. And the, all of this has basically allowed us to have a single on call in charge of the whole network. So let's talk about some lessons that we have learned and recommendations for people you know, in, this, in this journey. Right? So recommendation number one is to reuse existing tools and code 
when possible and when it makes sense. Like a typical, a typical thing that tends to happen in some organizations that you have, well, somebody wrote System X and some other people go into and instead of trying to maintain System X or, or tweak it or adapt it, they go into this, oh, I'm going to rewrite this and call it, you know, Poltergeist, for, for an example. Poltergeist wasn't, re wasn't like this, but now the, the guy that did this in the US is going to hate me. Um, so the idea is to be flexible, right? The idea is to move fast and to use, you know, if you have a system that you're tweaking it a little bit, you can actually just adapt it to your needs. This is probably better than just having your own. An example of this in our case is FR. FR was originally designed to handle, to do things on the servers. And we basically took it and made it work into the networking devices, right? And now we use it a lot more than the server guys. Hacks quickly become important tools, right? And this is a lesson learned, uh, let's say, under events, right? And like this is something that it has happened to me where oh, I was in the middle of an event, there was an automation or the automation wasn't sufficient to cover that particular scenario and you were in this situation, okay, so like this is really broken, so how do I check, you know, like 500 devices have gone down, right? And they have come back up because of a power event, you know, UPS magic, etc. So how do I check that the 500 devices are back online, right? So like, you know, doing this by hand doesn't work. Or how do I check the health of those 500 devices? So you hack something in your favorite script language, Bash, Python, Perl, uh, Ruby, or whatever, and you get the status of the 500 devices in 20 minutes instead of 17 hours, right? And then you say after the event, wouldn't that be nice to have it always, right? And then you make it into a production tool. That's a, that has happened in, to some of these, right? But since, th since those are essentially hacks, Instrumentation and unit tests and documentation are required for all things because if you're not going or when you're even for yourself, let's forget about the fact that someone else wants to extend your tool or wants to touch your tool or wants to do anything with your tool. Even when you are doing your own, what we call sometimes called archaeology, without having these things, it tends to be much harder and people end up, oh, I have no idea how this works. This is black magic. I'm just going to rewrite it, right, which is not ideal. Vote for feedback often, and this is an interesting one because there are some of these tools are not necessarily used by my team. Some of these tools are consumed by either folks doing deployment or folks that are doing, you know, people that are in the data centers or people that are in the pops, right? So there, we have ways of essentially marking devices as, you know, this device, somebody is doing something, this device, alarming, ignore it forever, right? Or ignore it for a time being, right? So there, there was such a tool and there was an event where, you know, like, one of this, one of the half of, of uh, a maintenance wasn't, this wasn't done, right? So basically weird things happened because like, they were doing some maintenance and the automation was trying to like, oh, this is broken, I'm gonna do things with it, which didn't end well. And then when we start like doing the post-mortem of how this is happened, right? Like we realized, okay, so like half of this was tagged as this is maintenance and half of it wasn't, right? And there's a tool that does all of this without any human intervention. You just go like, I want this to happen and it takes care of the whole dependency, right? So when we start poking, when I found the, the person that was responsible for this, I asked him, so why did you do this for only half of the, the maintenance or half of the devices that you were gonna put on their maintenance? And he told me like, well, or why don't you use, uh, the question I asked was, why don't you use the tool, right? And he told me, well, I don't use the tool because the tool is too slow. So basically he, he only did it for half and he forgot about the other half and he didn't use the tool and he wasn't using the tool, right? And I told him like, well, have you reported this to someone, right? That the tool is too slow for your needs. And he told me, no. I told him, okay, so if you don't tell me, it's complicated, right? So like we have done tweaks to have tighter feedback loops, to have automation to do some of this stuff, to like realize when some of these things are done by hand, but like it boils down to poke for feedback, especially if the tools that you're writing, you are not the main consumer, right? Number five, it's an interesting one, which is networking devices don't have powerful CPUs, right? And this is, uh, this is sad and hilarious at the same time. Uh, but essentially like, most of you, like, we really, really like data, and we really, really like to have fresh data, so we are really, really, really aggressive with what we get out of the devices. So most, and we, we come, there's people in my team that come strictly from, like, server background, from, like, PE background, and essentially they are like, what do you mean I cannot pull this device every 10 seconds to get this counter, right? And we actually did an experiment on, on, part of the, on the part of the routing fleet where we went, okay, so let me show you the impact that this has, right? And we actually disabled most of the collections for, I don't remember what it was, 20 minutes or something. And we actually saw the device, the CPU the consumption of those devices go down 50%, right? We actually saw like the power graphs of those devices go down and it wasn't 50%, it was like 25. So it's interesting. And we have seen this affect negatively where you're, like, 
yeah, like five, where this actually has um, significant impact into the core functions of those devices, which is to move packets, right? The sooner the robots take over, the better. Like most of these problems are very complicated to scale with people and people tend to be imperfect and people tend to make mistakes and people tend to make the same mistake over and over again. So the sooner you have some sort of automation or some sort of tooling, the better. Talk is cheap, focus on impact. And the idea, the, the, why are we making this point is that because it's very easy to have ideas, right? It's very easy to say, okay, we should have a system that does, does this. Actually sitting down and implementing those tends to be what counts, right? So focus on implementing things, right? And it ties very nicely with this one, which is done is better than perfect. Another thing that we have realized, another thing we tend to do a lot is to try not to cover 100% of the use cases out of the bat, right? We try to say, okay, so like, this will help us out in 90% of situations, 95% of situations, let's just release this and iterate over it, right? And with experience from the users and with experience from our own own calls and you know how this actually performs, we can tweak and you know change the design or change how this behaves or change how this operates, right? Questions? So the issue like you described with the router that was having a memory leak and you know these, these grave failures um, tend to also mess up your monitoring because you cannot monitor properly or you know it's that device is in a data path to monitor everything else. Do you monitor in band or out of band? How do you handle that? We monitor everything we can. So there is I mean like there's there is a lot of source of alarms and some of it is for example like the packet loss which is essentially we monitoring through devices, right? Which is, you but, know. But, right, but that, you know, if the device is losing packets, it might impact everything that is behind it. So you're losing visibility into that, or that could be a component. Well, I mean, like, the know, devices are, there's typically, I mean, like, things are, there's a lot of ECMP, right? So there's typically not a device or series of devices that, it tends to be very wide, right? So, and most of the time, like, for example, right, like, there's collections, right? We're getting this counter, we're getting this, uh, a lot of counters. We're getting a lot of counters every minute, every second, or whatever, right? If that fails, that generates alarms, right? So as soon as a device, obviously this is, this is not true for absolutely everything because, I get, you know, like that's the magic of vendors. They get to surprise you with new and interesting mystical failures, right? Um, I was telling some of them about one, but, um, but essentially, yes. Like, for example, if I expect the device to be reporting all of these counters and he stops doing this for two minutes, I will get an alarm, right? And like based on your experience with that platform or based on, you know, like events, you can make, okay, so if this happens, assume that it's bad, drain it, right? So, or you can feed it all. Some of this stuff also gets fed into like, uh, yeah, like systems that w will essentially say, okay, so this uh, device has had many events of different types. I think uh, it's bad, right? And you tweak it and like, sometimes you find these mystical issues without actual traffic impact. But this is an ever evolving battle process adventure type of thing. Uh, so I have a question first. Sorry, I'm hearing myself. Um, so obviously you've built a lot of tools for yourselves internally. Do you plan on releasing any of the tools that you use as part of your open compute project? There are some, I mean, like there are some parts of it that are actually getting released. The problem with some of this is that there's, it's not that we wouldn't want to release them, it's that they're supremely interlocked with all of our internal things, right? Like, there are some things where the dependencies are, are it's, it's, it was never built to be released, right? So like there is, there is the level of assumptions makes it a lot very complicated, but we are doing things with open source with things like Ethos, and like we also have a DHCP thing and like, yeah, we, we like open source, but like things like this are complicated, right? Or they, the, the dependencies are quite big. So anyone else? I've got a quick one. Um, so one of the talks we did at Net DevOps was talking about service advertisement and service discovery. So this is a two-parter question. Uh, so part one is, how do you get different like configuration uh, instances or, or how do you get different nodes into the system? And the second question then is, do you spend a lot of time tuning for like false positives and just tuning in general um, for that one person who's on call? <laughs> I mean. There is, like, I mean, like, the first part is you're talking about deployment, you're talking about network devices, servers. Uh, 
I mean, network elements, it's, they're stooling around that. So most provisioning is go provision, right? And like when there's a new platform, or so there's a new topology, or there's a, there is a change, like somebody has to, you know, account for that change and has to make sure that the tools have the same coverage, right? Like, for example, is something I'm going to say next. And regarding the second part of the question was, sorry. Uh, just around tuning and tuning and false positives. This is an ever evolving process, right? Like false positives tend not to happen that much, right? Because most of the time, We'll end up switching uh, switching microphones then. There you go. Yeah. So I don't know if you could you could, you got to hear my answer. The false positives. Yeah. So I mean, there is some of this stuff because the network continues to evolve and continues to change very rapidly. I mean, it's very normal for parts of the network or even most of the network to be renewed, replaced, improved, upgraded every few months, right? So there is maintenance that goes along with it. And this is true. I mean, th this is part of the nature life cycle of every tool. Like, it's the same thing as if you are not paying attention to the tools, then the tools will break or they will no longer um, reflect the reality of your network, right? And as long as the network changes, you have to stay on top with the tooling, right? But there are systems that are, you know, like there are systems that most of the time can run pretty much on their own, right? There are systems on those boxes that nobody really maintains that much, right? So I talk a little bit about what we have done, let's talk a little bit about what we are actually doing, right? And there are several things. An important thing is FBOS, which is FBOS, which is our own network OS, Wedge, which is our own uh, network platform, and Sixpack, which is something similar to uh, chassis, right? So my team is very focused on ensuring that we have feature parity with regards of other vendors, so you know, operationally and you know, in, a config in the configuration side of things, we are pretty much equivalent and we are able to have the same level of visibility and the same capacities that we have with any other box on the network, right? Another thing we're also very actively working on is the optical space. The optical space is one of those areas where it has lag behind the industry. So bridging those two worlds, the optical and the IP world and actually having, you know, a good understanding of you know, the path end-to-end -end from an IP and from an optical perspective, so we have better, f for example, correlation, right? PCE, which is path computation element, which is essentially taking the brain a little bit outside of the devices. So you have controllers essentially, you know, taking traffic decisions or being able to, you know, optimize how traffic flows around the network. And then the last point, which is what we're talking about now, which is continuous development of existing tools, which the, the tools require to be maintained. As long as the network is changing, the tools need to be uh, tweaked. And that's all for me. And I leave you with one question. Awesome stuff. Thank you so much, Jose. Um, so guys, uh, we've got some pizza. We're going to set it up on the table over here. Uh, what I'd recommend, if it's okay with Jose, is uh, during the break, maybe you can come and, and have a chat, introduce yourselves, maybe ask some, some more questions. Um, we're going to just put on some background music, have a bit of a munch, maybe grab another drink, and uh, we're going to reconvene in probably about 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, if that's okay. All right. Thank you so much, Jose. Thank you. So just a one minute call, one minute call, curtains, lights up, lights down.
All right, gentlemen, maybe we can get you to, to retake your seats. We're going to kick back off again. And I'm going to hand over to Darren, who's going to uh, tell us a little bit about starting to code. Oh, we've got a timer as well. That's awesome. OK, Darren. Hi. So this is more of a personal journey. So uh, some of you guys may already be coding. So if so, then it's not going to be much use to you. But those who aren't, uh, this is just a, my own journey of how I started. And uh, maybe you can get some advice out of it. So what's the audience? Obviously, network engineers, that's why we're all here. Uh, but anyone else who may be interested in starting coding. So why? Uh, the world is becoming more automated. Uh, scale is going faster than headcount. Uh, and we are required to, do, to look after a lot more than uh, we used to. Uh, you don't need to become a fully full software uh, developer. Um, but you need to know how this stuff works. Uh, because it's becoming more and more important. Uh, you need to be able to automate a lot of uh, your network. Um, so yeah. Thoughts. A lot of people think, uh, you know, automate is just about scale, but it's not. Um, one of the things that, you know, automation also brings to you is um, making things consistent. Uh, what I mean by that is, uh, you know, you may need to check uh, if 1,000 of your switches are configured correctly. Uh, people used to be able to, you know, used to log into it individually, check things that, you know, they were, you know, everything was fine. Um, but that's, that's, you know, it's, it's just, it's just, as the scale goes, you know, higher, uh, it's just becoming too much of a burden. Um, automation helps with, you know, not only the configuration of the devices, but making sure that everything is actually consistent and configured the way you want it to. Uh, the problem is, um, you know, this garbage in, garbage out thing where if you make mistakes, uh, you can screw up your network really bad very quickly. Uh, because you know, if you've got a script running that logs in and does a bunch of things, um, it can do very bad things very quickly. So where did I start? Uh, books, of course. Um, this one I started with because why Python? Everybody seemed to be talking about Python. Uh, I was an absolute beginner, so why not? Uh, it's actually a pretty good book. Um, it's, it's not very network centric, but it, it does really teach you the fundamentals. Um, if you do a search for, you know, where do I start Python programming, uh, this one on the right comes up quite often. Um, it's actually pretty good. Uh, it's not really hard. Uh, what he means by the hard way is um, instead of just reading code examples like in most books and explaining you, you know, how it works, uh, he forces you to kind of type the code out. Uh, and that's what he means by the hard way. Um, and that makes it pretty good, uh, you know, actually doing it. Um, not just reading out of somebody else's code, but actually doing it uh, yourself. You know, it really ingrains it in your head. Um, this one on the left here is actually pretty good. Um, forget ab about the fact that it says hackers, forensic analysis, penetration testers, etc. It's actually very focused on networking. Um, that's why I like it. Um, so I thoroughly recommend that book. But that's a bit boring. Uh, what I mean by that is when I started with that first book, uh, you know, you go through code examples, uh, but ultimately you don't real, you don't really get empathy with what you're working with because I think the, the, the project that you're working with are somebody else's projects. Uh, you know, it's, it's some guy saying, you know, make, make this do this. Uh, it, it's not really, you don't really have a feeling for that project. Uh, what I think really helps is if you have your own project. What I mean by that is just think of anything. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be work related. It can be something at home. Uh, Find just something that you want to automate or just, just code and then put your, you know, your heart and soul into that. Um, that really helps actually, uh, you seem to, I don't know, when, when, you, when you're building something for yourself, uh, you seem to put a lot more effort into it 
instead of just you know helping someone else, you know going through someone else's example. Um, obviously, you need to know the basics. So, you know that first book I I, I showed. Um, you know, learn obviously learn the basics. You know what variables are, what loops are, and so on. Uh, you know, it doesn't even have to be Python. All all, lam all computer languages are, are pretty very similar when it comes to this kind of thing. Uh, variables, loops, functions, etc. Uh, how they implement it, yes, is slightly different, but uh, they're all pretty much the same. Um, and like I said, find something that you want to do, whatever it is, uh, anything, anything at all. Uh, break the problem down into programmable mistakes and uh, throw yourself headfirst into the problem. So, you know, the very first time you do it, it's probably, you know, it's not going to be very good. Uh, but just keep iterating and uh, you know, you'll come up with something that you know, is, resembles decent code. Um, but you know, I, I think that's, that's the best way to learn. Uh, like I said, you will stumble there, but anytime you need to figure out how to manipulate something, you generally get to Stack Overflow. Uh, it seems to be like the second Google uh, when it comes to code anyway. Um, yeah. If you prefer videos, I don't personally. I don't like videos. I I, I actually learn better out of book, but most people prefer videos. If so, uh, we seem to live in a t in a time when uh, you can find almost anything online. Uh, there's something called MOOCs, which are massive open online courses. Uh, there's so many online courses available, especially to learn how to code, but to learn almost anything. Uh, a large amount of uh, computer science related courses. Um, I do, however, say that most of them seem to be, it's almost like an advertisement for the university. And what I mean by that is, uh, the, you know, the, the, the courses that they offer are very much focused on maybe the first or second year um, of computer science. Um, if you really want to get deeper, you know, they don't, you, you kind of probably have to go to the university themselves, but. Uh, like I said in the beginning, you don't, you know, we're not looking to become full, full on software engineers. Uh, you know, the, the first, you know, year or two of study that they actually give is actually good enough for, for probably 90% of what you want to do, uh, which is which is good. Uh, what have I done? So these are just some of the ones that I have done. Uh, these you can all find online for free, which is great. Um, the first one. Uh, was kind of touching about you know object oriented programming, how to do it. Uh, the second one is kind of more of a generic course. Uh, it, you know they they use C, they don't use uh, Python, but uh, it's again it 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 kind of just teaches you how to think computationally. Uh, the third one as well, that's a, a, a one by MIT. Uh, that's also again they use Python as a vehicle to teach you how to think computationally. So you know how to visualize take a problem and visualize it into a set of algorithms and once you've done that it, it's quite easy to um, you know turn that into an actual application uh, but because there's so many more you know there's so many uh, these are some of the ones that I've been looking at to actually do uh, again all of these are free so you know knock yourself out really it, 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 there's just so much actually available online these days uh, it's a bit crazy actually um, so as an example this is something that I was working on. Um, it's just a, uh, uh, you know, something I thought of that would that would be pretty fun. Uh, I started a Twitter account that just essentially uh, tweeted the uh, BGP table size four times a day, and uh, it's actually got quite a few, quite a few hundred followers, if you can believe it. Uh, but this was actually just for me to, you know, it, it kind of taught me a bunch of things: how to, for example, how to interact with uh, a BGP daemon in the background. Um, how to interact with APIs to actually uh, tweet this, ki this stuff out. Uh, I learned how to, you know, manipulate JSON files, MySQL files, uh, how to come up with graphs. All of these are quite handy for, you know, normal work-related stuff. Um, but, you know, it's, 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 it's stuff that, you know, was interesting because, again, if it's your own project, you think, oh, you know, this would be pretty cool to do X or, or Y. Uh, how do I do it? I don't know how to do it. So, you know, break it down into steps. You know, step one, I need to be able to extract this kind of information. How do I do that? Uh, you know, go up to Google. You do a little bit of searching. Stack Overflow normally comes up. Uh, and it says, okay, uh, you know, this is how to iterate and, and, you know, extract this kind of information. Uh, 
So again, having a project that you, you, you're really into uh, really, really helps with, you know, just, again, you, you put your passion into it if you, if, if, if you have it. Uh, as I said, uh, every six hours, uh, it treats the current table sizes. Um, again, it's, it's, it's pretty silly, but, uh, you know, again, I've got quite a few hundred followers. If I check, uh, if I just check them out now. Someone's got 668, and quite annoyingly, the IPv6 account has a few hundred less. <laughs> like always, but uh, yeah, it should, but uh, it hasn't. Uh, it tweaks the grass. It actually creates an image once a week, um, showing the actual table size going up and down. Uh, and it if, and uh, I've also got it. It does that monthly as well, at even six monthly. So since the beginning of the year, this is the BBG4 table size has gone up, and uh, the B6 table. But these are, I mean, these are these are silly little things. But again, the skills you learn from doing something small like this you know, really helps when you try and put it into the real world. Um, some of the issues. So, when it comes to network engineering anyway, uh, unfortunately, most of the devices you work with, switches, routers, um, the vast majority of the time when you need to pull state from that box, uh, it's still coming from the CLI. Uh, yes, there's other ways to get it, but a lot of stuff comes with the CLI. Uh, and unfortunately, the CLI is designed for a human reader. And what I mean by that is, uh, it's just text. So you, you send a query, and you get a bunch of text. Um, now, you can, you, know, you can use regex and so on to actually extract the information you want out of that. But it's error prone. Um, you know, with different versions of, of, of vendor codes, you know, they, they may change the output slightly, they may insert a colon, they may insert a comma that completely messes your regex up. Um, so really, you know, I think there is a big push to get to the vendors to, to kind of uh, make a lot of the state information, uh, you know, extractable via an API. For example, you know, I may want uh, to extract and LSP uh, information. So I want to be able to request, say, from a writer, this is the LSP. I want you to return information about all the writers that it, this LSP is going through, and maybe the state of that LSP. So I want a list of whatever. Uh, that would be much nicer than having to actually say, you know, show MPLS LSP whatever, uh, and then trying to actually regex that kind of information out. It's really, really complicated, and it can get really, really messy. Uh, Hopefully, vendors are moving, you know, towards more towards that, um, but you know, they, they definitely have a long way to go still when it comes to that. Uh, on my particular project, um, I've got kind of to, to, to get around this. Instead of you know the main code I have, instead of uh, asking information directly from the daemon running on the server, I have another middle piece of code you could say, uh, and that kind of abstracts. This information. So what I mean by that is, I my main code will say, "Get me the route count." Uh, my middle code will then actually extract that information, pass the information. So that means that if the daemon happens to change the way the output is done, I can change the code pretty easily. Uh, it also means that you know, if I have another service that needs to use that same kind of code, I don't have to put the same regex in there. Uh, but definitely, there is there is work to do when it comes to that. Uh, so. Basically, like as I said, this is my you know my journey. This is you know this could be yours. Learn the basics. Find yourself a project. That's really important. Something simple. You know, make it more complicated after that. But for me, this is this is really really important. Uh, view some online stuff. You know, and then just just practice. Make mistakes. Uh, go back to the beginning. Relearn. You know, keep doing it. Um, you know, automate all the things that eventually. Um, yeah. Any questions? Yeah. So maybe you could. I've got. I've got like two, two or three parter. <laughs> okay. 
Um, so number one, when you're pulling the V4 and the V6 route table, uh, A, where are you pulling it from? Is it a RET reflector? Is it a, you know an active uh, BGP pair? That's question one. Yep. Question two is what are you using to generate your images? Are you using like GNU plot or something like that? Mm -hmm. um, and question three, am I allowed to have three three parter? Yeah. <laughs> uh, question three is like I keep going back to Bash for some reason. Like for portability, maybe I should be going back to Java. Like I, I did CompSci. <laughs> uh, I don't like to code that often, but I do like to build things and stick stuff together. Yeah. Um, what was your experience? I mean, going into Python. I've done a little bit of Python, but to me, yeah. So, question one: BGP route reflector is question mm -hmm. two: graph. Question three: Python. Okay. So I'm going to start with question three. Um, why, why did I start with Python? I think when, when I was looking around to start automating stuff, uh, it was kind of what a lot of people were talking about. Uh, and I started with it, and I kind of stuck with it at least for a little while. Um, and I found it quite easy to start with. Uh, it's, it's actually quite easy. Uh, it does have issues when, you, when your code starts to get you know, more than 400 lines, perhaps. Um, you know, I've got another piece of code which just keeps failing because it's just, it becomes very unmaintainable, I think. Uh, very lost, you know, Python. But um, I, I started with it. It, it. It's been good to me, um, and actually, it's 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 quite powerful. I mean, it's it's powerful enough to to automate a lot of stuff, as it were. You know, it's it's not the kind of application I probably you know it's not the kind of language I'd be using you know on a back end. You know, maybe a huge database system. You know, running many thousands of processes. I probably wouldn't be using it then. Uh, but if you need something to just log into a bunch of stuff, get state, push state, um, it's it's pretty good and it's 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 quite easy to to learn. Um, as for what I use, um, so on my server, uh, it actually runs Bird. So if you ever heard of Bird, so this is actually a live. Um, it has it's running live BGP with a whole bunch of um, Providers, I'll check here. I'm actually clipped off a bit here. Maybe if I just turn it to the left. Yeah, so this is SSH station to my server, yeah. And uh, these are all live B2B sessions. These are the V4 sessions because uh, Bird runs separate daemons for V4 and V6. Um, so yes, the, any any information you get out of that uh, out of that Twitter account is 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 live. Um, you know, it goes up and down constantly. Um, so if I, th the easy way to get your, your right count is here is just use that command. Um, so out of all, I think I've got seven peers there. That's four and a half million uh, rib and, you know, 565,000 fib. Um, same with bird six. So uh, there is a separate daemon for this. Now, thankfully, uh, the actual to get the size to tweet every six hours is really easy because passing that is really easy. Uh, but obviously, if you if you're trying to do anything more complicated, uh, some of the things I'm working on in the background, for example, is is actually checking how many um, how many routes are slash 24, slash 23, slash 22, etc., etc., etc. The only way to do that is to do a show on the full running table uh, and then check how many you know. First of all, regex out the actual routes themselves, and then regex out how many are slash whatever. Um, but again, if, for example, if I wanted to do, you know, if I wanted, you know, to automate, let's say, show my communities, the only way to do it at the moment with this, with this at the moment is to do, you know, do the show, f uh, sh show route full, uh, and then try and regex out the communities, for example. Um, it's messy. I mean, it's, it's possible, but it's, it's really messy. It would be nice, you know, if you had some kind of API again to say, just show me the communities for this route, and, you know, and all I want is uh, returned is actually a list of communities. And then it's really easy to do, you know, stuff with that. So what was your second question? Okay. Uh, I'm using, for, for, for that graph, I'm using a, a, a library called matplotlib, which is a Python library. Um, 
it's really good but really frustrating at the same time. It's extremely powerful. It's, it's got like seriously a million different ways to graph, um, which is great, you know, but with great power comes great frustration, I would say, because it's really difficult to try and get a graph exactly the way you want it. It took me a while to get that, but you know, once you get it, you're like, sweet, let me just keep that. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's pretty good. Any other questions? One, one, two. What has been your uh, experience with the uh, um, like APIs that vendors provide compared to using CLI? Um, asking because I recently spent a bunch of time reading like release notes from many vendors, and it seems like that API-related stuff has so much bugginess, especially related to committing stuff. You know, when you're applying configuration, compared to that is obviously working fine on the mm -hmm. CLI. I think all vendors have a long way to go uh, when it comes to that. Uh, certain vendors, I mean, I think out of all vendors, Juniper probably gives some of the easiest information to pass because you can kind of display via XML. So you can, you know, instead of, instead of just getting raw text, you can kind of get an XML tree and then it's quite easy to get fields out of that. Um, you know, with Cisco, it's 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 pretty difficult. Um, there, I think there is a, a a big push to try and you know get this out of them, but I still find it pretty complicated. Um, you know, like I said, you know, it's 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 quite easy to regex, and you can come up with some really fancy regex which works. Uh, but then the next code version, they may change something tiny, and it completely breaks everything that you have. So it's it's pretty nasty. In fairness, we probably want uh, something like JSON instead of XML, like, like parsing stuff with XML Starlet or something <laughs> is a little bit of a yeah. pain in the bum. Anyone else got any other questions? I think we're going to uh, like just take one minute to, to set up the systems, and then we're going to hand over to Christian. Maybe we just uh, give a bit of a round of applause for Darren. Thank you very much, Darren. You. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Hello, 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 yeah, it's working. Right, so now for the experiment of the evening. Um, does this work? Well, first experiment, getting remote controls to work. <laughs> so every time I point at you, right, and then. <laughs> so my presentation should be really quick, and it has two relatively new things. First of all, it's the sink or swim idea. Um, this is something I thought about. Um, instead of doing a presentation for the full time and you know rushing in a few questions at the end, was do a quick presentation and then have a lot more time, not only for questions but for people expressing their opinions regarding relating to what you just presented. So. The naming then came from Dono, who found, who knows about some um, TV show, was it? No, 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 you, you suggested that sink or swim thing, yeah. So apparently there was a, a TV show and the name just stuck. Uh, hopefully it's going to be a good one. Um, the idea of the format is that somebody presents a technology, um, a project they've been doing, um, something that's coming from a vendor, but not necessarily. Maybe you have this nice IETF draft 
that's really close to your heart and you want to get it out and get people talking about it. Or there's some project that you think you could put in some time, but you don't know if you, should, if you really should. And then you want to know if people actually like it and they think it would be useful or may, and maybe find some contributors. I think this is the, kind, the right format for it. You come, you say a few words about it, you say the, the main points, and then you let people find out the rest from you directly by asking questions and telling you it, it's good or it sucks. <coughs> um, obviously, we don't have a lot of time, so after the presentation and after the, all the, the sessions have ended, we'll be going to have a drink maybe, and then I'll set up for this particular one, I'll set up a, a topic on the Google group. So if you want to post something there, post there or get in touch with me via Twitter or anything else. So now to the topic at hand, this is something that Cisco likes to push uh, right now because, hey, the SDN bandwagon is starting to become more specific. So now instead of having just SDN this, SDN that, you have SD somethings, SD data center, SD WAN, uh, what have you. On the left is the stuff that you've probably heard before with the SDN markings, right? And it is a severe case of deja vu. If you don't know about what, what that is, it is that feeling that you've heard this bullshit before. Um, there is a very nice article there that if you, if you care about this kind of what this happens, uh, why this happens, um, Networking Nerd has a very good article about what marketing people do and how they they get this hype going and then forcing people and vendors into creating certain solutions. But anyway, so what has Cisco done in this area? They, they decided that they needed to do to have a product out there. And while this is the disclaimer part, I'm not selling Cisco, I'm not working for Cisco, I'm not here advertising anything for them. I think it's interesting. Some bits of what they're doing are interesting. Some bits are scary. And I want to know if you guys have the same opinion or not. And you think that, that anything good will come out of it, basically. So what they're trying to do with Cisco IWAN is they're, they're taking a load of different technologies, putting them together, um, getting them very far from the elimination of vendor lock-in because all the stuff they're doing to put all these technologies together is vendor lock-in. So if you, if you buy into their solution or any other SD-WAN solution, you're theirs for a lot of years, depending on how much money you put in. Um, but the good thing that they're doing, from my point of view, is that they're taking a load of established protocols, uh, a few technologies that have been out there for a long time, years, tens of years, and they're using them uh, in a way that promotes um, standardization, templating, and automation. And I think this is a really good thing. Um, there is some stuff there that uh, I'll talk about, which is their own specific stuff done behind the scenes, which is probably not that good. Okay, thank you. So IWAN has kind of four parts to it. I'm only talking about three because the fourth is security, and it's the boring security. It's firewalls and encryption, right? Encryption is tied into the MVPN. It's something quite simple. By the way, if there's any acronym here, I'm thoroughly aware that not everyone is a CCIE, so if there's any acronym that doesn't make sense, just stop me and ask, right? So the MVPN is, in their view, in everybody's view, actually, it's, it's a hub-and-spoke topology that allows for spoke-to-spoke -spoke communication. So they're trying to make it usable in all kinds of deployments. You have a big, maybe you're a let's say a supermarket, and you have a lot of small shops all around the country and a couple of big offices. Or maybe you have, a, I don't know, 10 bigger offices and you want them interconnected. I think it works for, for all of these just as well. Um, so this is the good part, right? It's the MVPN. It's nothing new. It's nothing that hasn't been done before. It's been sh proved to work. The code is stable and more or less stable and uh, it scales, right? It's, it scales to tens of thousands of spokes. It, 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 depending on your hardware, it can go up very well. Um, what the point of the transport side is, regardless of what you have underneath, 
you have a tunnel over it, which allows you to use routing protocols, to put multicast over it, and more or less have some calls. Now, I'm saying more or less because if you go over the internet, all bets are off. If you go over mobile, again, things are going to be, you know, random because it's wireless. Um, but they give you all the functionality that you might want as long as you're aware of the caveats. And they also uh, give you... Um, right, so before jumping into the next bit, I pulled these um, from the CVDs, the Cisco Validated Designs or whatever it stands for. The newer versions of these documents are actually pretty good. They, they've started actually pumping up the quality. And um, these are just to put some images to my words, right? This is how, in their view, some potential branches will look like. It's one or two routers with a mix of connectivity options. Either you've got MPLS and internet, or you've got only internet. You can replace one of those internets with, with mobile, for example. There's a lot of stuff that can be, for example, um, a shop that will need only some mobile, or maybe it will have some dedicated MPLS as its main link with a bit of backup in case things go wrong and they still need, let's say, the tills to work. This is one of the images for the head office where you've got some bigger routers that act as the hubs. For each connectivity option, you're gonna have one DMVPN overlay. So they're spreading this on different routers. Um, and obviously, you need, you need to have some firewalls in front of the internet to keep the baddies out. Yeah. So this is where it gets a bit scary with Cisco's image because they're introducing everybody's best, best friend, especially if you study for CCIE, which is performance routing. Now, PFR, I'm not sure how many, did, did any of you actually use it in production at any point in the past? I, d I don't think even Cisco have uh, fully deployed it internally. <laughs> yeah, we should ask them, do you have any office where you're using PFR? And now they will say, yes, we have IWAN there. Because I think, so what they're saying is, right, it's what they're saying, it's nothing tested yet because I think they have deployments in the under 100 worldwide or something like that. Uh, they're saying that they cleaned it up a lot and they made config a lot easier. Thank you very much, I took CCIE before, it wasn't clean at all, right? Um, so, and they're trying to give you bits of config so you can build it easily. I don't think anyone's gonna do that. That's my personal opinion. Where I think they can actually get this thing in is when they automate it and they put a GUI in front of it, which they're actually trying to do. They're trying to put this APIC EM, which is, oh God, Application Policy Infrastructure Controller, something like that. EM stands for Enterprise Modules. Um, so they're putting this controller in front with a GUI that actually manages configs and uh, manages devices and deploys templates on them. And this is good because it takes away some of this, oh, that's not good. <laughs> Uh, it takes away all of the complexity of you configuring stuff, but then again, you don't really know what's going in there. Uh, or it's a lot harder to troubleshoot, right? Because they're putting stuff, they know how it works. You don't really know how it works. You have access to the devices, but... Mm. So this is, again, something I don't like. Um, but again, if you want to, to automate, and you, you need to trust your automation. When this automation comes from an external source, you have some questions. So PFR has to do a few things. It has to monitor the network. It has to, to, to verify that your links are working, they're sane, and they're within parameters, and if not, move traffic to a different link. It also helps load balance if you have applications that take load balancing easily over links that maybe have different profiles and so on. Um, and the, the, the rest of it is if you want to load balance applications rather than just some flows based on IPs, you need to identify those flows and they've introduced NBAR2. Again, this NBAR used to be a very niche topic in the CCIE. I'm, I'm sure it still is. Um, I think they're doing some, some interesting stuff, for example. If you have encrypted traffic, you cannot see what application is inside. So they do a bit of deep packet inspection. Um, 
And what they said was that if you have encrypted traffic, they will sniff a bit of the certificate exchange as much as they can, check who owns that certificate, uh, and then check also who's the DNS for the, those IPs that are being used in transit. And then based on that, you know, you see the IPs of Microsoft, you see some certificates from them, then, you know, probably it's, uh, maybe it's Office 365 that, that you're running. It's the best you can do, I guess, with encrypted traffic, unless you have a proxy that is man in the middling, all, the, all that uh, encrypted uh, communication. And at the end, you've got a couple of more esoteric things, which is doing Akamai on, on their branch routers. So doing like mini CDNs and WAS. WAS, which again, I'm not sure how many people use, but uh, it's, uh, I'm not gonna dwell on it too much. One other interesting thing quickly was zero touch deployment. You go to a branch, you don't want to send your good engineer to each branch, if, especially if you have hundreds or thousands of them. You want to send somebody with, with a device so that somebody needs to know how to plug it in, turn it on, and then it should start working. So they have some PMP config, you put a USB stick in it and then it, it calls home and, and pulls the config. The problem that I have with this is maybe special for me, but it's HTTP. It's not S, it's not secured until in the later stages. So what it does, it, it, it gets to your controller um, over unencrypted, uh, an unencrypted connection, and it also does an iOS upgrade over this unencrypted connection. So this is man in the middle ball very nicely if you wanted to. Of course, then the APIC, the controller pushes a, certi has a user certificate authority and then encrypts everything and gives it, gives it config and everything. Unless they do some very smart, you know, rootkit detection or check something afterwards, which I don't think they will, <laughs> you cannot detect some of the nastier stuff that's being done. Um, I talked a bit about scalability. This is something that ties in with what Darren was saying. So um, at NFD, Network Field Day, um, the guys were actually asking them over and over again, how do they do the southbound integration from the controller to the devices? It's still CLI and SMP, and they didn't really like the questions, and they were kind of beating around the bush. Oh yes, we're, we're trying to do other things, maybe NetConviang, maybe some, some stuff through 1PK or other technologies of theirs, but reality is, this is what they have now, and this is what they're focusing on delivering, and basically this is what you'll get for a couple of years probably. So I'm not sure they're pushing hard enough for, for, for any of this. And um, another thing that I caught was scalability. They're, they tested with 2,000 branches, and they, they're saying that basically, oh yes, this was in, in our lab, this is a, the most we could do in our lab, Maybe you could do more, maybe you could do with virtual domains, but you can only get your virtual domain up to 2,000. So that basically means, yeah, you can do 2,000. The MVPN goes to an order bigger than that, so it is a trade-off. Now, not many organizations will have, I don't know, so many branches that they will need at su such scale, but it, it is something to, to keep in mind. So, and a couple of screenshots just for, you know, some, some eye candy, right? This is how their APKM looks like. It gives you some nice, th this will work very well, to, I guess, to sell it to, to people that are not very technical. Um, you get your, your hub routers there, you know, they have nice green check marks and everything. Uh, you've got, you've got, um, this was a bit interesting, right? Because you've got some quas classes here. And this is something that is controlled centrally. And you can say, voice and video, I want it to go, maybe in, you have, uh, as options, you have MPLS and um, mobile. You know that mobile is not gonna be a very good option if you have VoIP that you need to run on it and video. So maybe you want to say that uh, I want everything to be prioritized over my MPLS connection, which has proper quality of service. Um, you can do that from here. Um, maybe you have some scavenger traffic, which is, I don't know, internet gaming, YouTube, and everything else. You can put that on your dedicated internet link. 
Um, another interesting thing that they were doing was saying, look, if my main link fails, then um, YouTube traffic, drop it. So if you don't have your primary link, your internet link to send it through, just drop it. Don't flood another connection that has business traffic. So now I've probably badly overstepped the, the time, but uh, I'd like to hear from you guys what you think about, about this. Um, if you see a use case, if you, if you think that it would be safe enough to deploy, and basically what I would like to know from you guys is will it sink or will it swim? Thank you. So uh, has anyone actually got experience with deploying IWAN or had like a pre-sales engineer from Cisco come out and like talk to them about PFR and IWAN? Just out of curiosity. I mean, if you don't want to say it, you don't have to, but... Uh <laughs> so I was going to ask you actually, Christian, uh, one of the challenges for your, your step one um, you, you were saying like you don't have to be a CCIE, but I was going to get you to like explain all the acronyms. I wanted to see if you actually knew like BGP, EIGRP, IPsec. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, it's cool. But uh, uh, so has anyone else been like thinking about SD WAN? I know like VeloCloud uh, make a, a compulsive case, and they've also been at like NFD nine or NFD ten. But uh, like Cisco, like you said, have, have been touting IWAN for a little while, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I haven't done too much research into it, but I've looked at it a little bit. And what I, I can't figure out is, so for for IWAN, it's a very, very early stage product. Okay. Like it is a bundle of services jammed together that they're testing people on. And Cisco do that all the time, right? They say, yeah. have this new technology. Here's SDX. What do you think? They They commit nothing to it. They bundle it together, they market the hell out of it, and they see what the customer response is. Yeah. And this is the, the, must be the seventh, eighth, ninth version of SDX for Cisco. And it, it's, it's, as an idea, it's great. But it, mm. you know, as in, we should solve all of these problems. Mm. What they haven't done is articulated what the problems are, but they said, here's all, a load of solutions. Yeah. Um, but as solution, I could, I could reverse, you could reverse engineer what, what some of the problems are. Mm. But uh, but they never seem to start with that. Here are the problems I'm solving for you as a customer. Here's the risk associated with it mm -hmm. in terms of all the complexity this is going to bring. And here's how you make a trade-off as to deciding whether this is worthwhile or not. Are, are you going to bank on this complexity paying off for you? And for me, maybe in five years' time, I'd look at this again if I was in an enterprise and say, I'm happy for other people to have been on the bleeding edge to have solved mm -hmm. all of the redundancy, failover, interaction, interop, QA problems that are going to arise. Mm -hmm. And then see, you know, are some of the problems useful. But even then you'd look at taking some slices out of it. Like zero touch deployment makes perfect sense. So that, that's I think the, the single problem obvious problem that they're trying to solve. Yeah, and that would be great. If somebody, if somebody just solves zero touch deployment for switches or routers, um, and hopefully did it in a vendor agnostic way, <laughs> then, then you know, you'd buy yeah. it because it, it's not that complicated and it's not that high a risk. Yeah. Okay, there are some security risks that you've highlighted, but that's one where automation pays off mm -hmm. without huge risk on the organization. Mm -hmm. So that would be my take on it. All right. Thank you. So I think that um, they're doing it a bit smartly because they, they, they're trying to say, if you look at the videos at NFD, they're trying to, to, to drive home the concept that, look, do step one, just do the MVPN, because that's tested and you know it works and you kind of know how, how, how it functions. Do that and then, you know, we'll, we'll push you slowly to, you know, enable PFR and see if that destroys your network or not. <laughs> um, so... Anyone else? So the, the, the DMVPN is, is like, I, I know I've deployed that for a couple of uh, hundred sites, satellite mm -hmm. sites and head end uh, in like, you know, campus or in the like HQ and it's worked pretty well. 
but um, I've never actually like delved into Iwan. So I was curious when they start mentioning EIGRP, is that one of the requirements, like that Cisco proprietary protocol versus like OSPF or another IGP? Are you, do you know that off the top of your head? Um, I don't know if it's if EIGRP is a requirement, but it's not proprietary anymore. Not, not, not that anybody else cares, you know, any other vendor cares, I don't think any... So is there like an open source routing engine for EIGRP that's been reverse engineered or they've published the specs? No, 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 they've, they've, they've made it an open standard. Wow, where was I? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Most of it. <laughs> yeah, except for like what triggers is stuck and active or something, then yeah. the rest is... <laughs> it's probably a half assed thing anyway, right? Because they... I don't know how many other, how many vendors just said, oh yes, let me implement that now that it's open. So, so uh, another, another part you mentioned was like WAS, and I'm almost ashamed to say I was like expected to sell WAS as a Cisco SE in Sydney for a while, yeah. and uh, even the SEs would just like giggle when uh, people mentioned WAS. But uh, in terms of like WAN acceleration or any kind of, uh, I guess, compression, does, does, like, is anyone using that out there, or is everyone actually realized that it's easier to just deal with like simple building blocks and like routing protocols and just leave the traffic as is and do capacity management? Has anyone got like any thoughts on that? My experience with any kind of WAN acceleration, it was um, it would main limitations were around like number of how, how much state can carry, like number of connections. Many times I ran into where a network security group or whatever security people, they would do like an NMAP scan and just basically take down the whole network because the connection tables are full. So. Uh, on that same thing, I think uh, you know these days bandwidth is pretty pretty cheap. Um, the problem with the you know WAN accelerators and all that it's you know it's not just you know you may you may squash some of your data down a bit but you know it adds delay to to that data because something needs to compress it something needs to uncompress it um, you know and like I said these days bandwidth is pretty cheap uh, compared I think it's easier to just and it's simpler as you say you know you th if there's less complexity if it's just raw data do you think there's anything in them doing a bit of CDN with Akamai? Maybe instead of just full blown was. I mean, I think it's many. They're doing it on ISRs or, or ASL 1K. So, how much could they store on them, mm. right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Just just on the uh, like the OSPF EIGRP bit. So for DMVPN specifically, I think OSPF is a horrible. You, you just can't run it. That's to do with the hierarchy and the summarization. So BGP and EIGRP are the only options, as far as I'm aware. I haven't done it myself, but I understand that BGP with dynamic neighbors is something quite interesting to do. Right? Yeah. <laughs> You're laughing, so. <laughs> do you have a horror story? No. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, Christian, all good? We are, yeah. Unless anyone else has, a, I don't know how we're for time. So. Yeah, so we're we're pretty much just just on the the, the timeline. Um, so maybe we will just do a little quick thanks to to Christian. Um, what we'll do, yeah. Thank you guys. Uh, thank you all for coming. I hope you've uh, had an informative and interesting session. Maybe chatted to someone new. Um, we're just gonna like hang out for maybe like five ten minutes. Put on some tunes. Uh, feel free to grab a bite. Finish your drinks. I don't know if you want to like crowdsource or organize if you want to go somewhere else for, for a drink or so on and so forth. But uh, yeah, thank you very much. We didn't actually get any, sub well, maybe we'll work on the prize thing and the, the campus definition another time. Mm -hmm. But uh, we can have it as homework for next time. Pretty right? much, yeah, 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 as homework, eh? Um, but as Christian said as well, like uh, this, is, this is for you guys. This is about you, it's about community. Mm -hmm. um, this is just one instantiation of what it could be. So like any feedback you want to put in the group, any ideas you have, like format, being honest, like this is easy to kind of, well, it's not easy, but it's, it's getting presentations and putting information out there is, is like traditional format. Um, what's more interesting sometimes is like a discussion or unconference or, or different formats. So we'd love to hear from you because this is about you, uh, not about us as such, it's just about building community. So. 
Yeah, I don't know. If, I don't know if you have anything else specific to to say or wrap up. What do you reckon? I think that's it. Thank you so much for coming to iNOC3. Check out the website. Check out Meetup. You know, follow us on Twitter if you've. A t really recommend gra grabbing a Twitter account. It's good for community. Curate your Twitter feed. Uh, if you don't like Twitter, cool, whatever. Let's do email. But uh, thank you so much for coming, and we'll talk to you again soon. Take it easy. Thank you.